Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ross Hoagland. I'm going to be your host tonight for the very first Reasons Forum. This is very exciting. So since it's the first one, I guess I need to explain what it is we're doing. We are going to be doing for five of the next last Thursdays of the month a Q&A with the different scholars from Reasons to Believe. Hugh Ross is going to be on tonight. We're very excited. This is going to be a Q&A. Hugh is only going to have about 20 minutes for his talk, and then we're going to do 50 minutes for your questions and answers. So it's mostly about you. So your responsibility is to ask some really good questions. Now, this is a safe environment. You can ask any questions you want. A lot of times in a lot of churches, it's not considered cool or whatever to ask tough questions. We invite the tough questions. That's what we really want here tonight. There's a couple of rules. Um, the event is being streamed live. There's a camera over there, camera over there. If you need to get up for any reason, there'll be a limbo bar under the cameras, okay? We expect you to shimmy under as best you can. If you need to use the restrooms, follow my finger. It's around this way, out that door, around back, and they're over there. You got that? OK. Um, even though you will, we have a live audience uh, out in Cyberland, and we also have you folks, you are invited to ask any questions you want to ask, but it's not going to be this kind of question. It's going to be this kind of question, okay? We want all the questions texted. You have something on your seat that tells you the number. You have this screen and this screen that tell you the number, and I'm going to tell you the number. The number is 657-234-0754. Text your questions in, okay? After the event, whether you're online or here live, there will be a survey that we're going to pass out to you folks here live. There'll be a button that comes on your screen afterwards um, for the live streaming event. We would really appreciate your feedback since this is our first one. I want to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Hugh Ross. What an amazing guy. He's founder and president of Reasons to Believe. He has a Bachelor of Science in Physics from the University of British Columbia. He has a PhD in Astronomy from the University of Toronto. He, for several years, he continued his research on quasars and galaxies as a postdoctoral fellow at Caltech. He's the author of multiple books on, and speaks on science and faith issues to audiences around the country. The subject of his talk tonight is going to be putting Genesis to the test. So please, warm welcome to Dr. Hugh Ross. Well, thank you for coming. And uh, you can contact us on social media. Our scholars at Reasons to Believe literally answer every question they get on Twitter and Facebook. So feel free to take advantage of that, because if you're like me, you think of the best question three hours after the event is over. And so we give you that opportunity to ask us questions long after this is over. Uh, I'm going to be uh, featuring two of the books that I've written, just giving you little snippets. But what we're doing this evening, we're actually offering a free chapter uh, from the Creator and the Cosmos that came out a few months ago, the fourth edition. And you get a free chapter by going to reasons.org slash Ross. And tonight we're talking about how to put Genesis to the test. So you can get a free chapter of uh, navigating uh, Genesis. But primarily what I'm going to be speaking about tonight are the discoveries of the past several months that allow us to put the book of Genesis to a test, a scientific test, that we couldn't do even a year ago. And so does advancing science affirm or refute what Genesis says about uh, creation. And here's a quick outline. I've always been told you should only have three points in a talk, so these are the three points. We're going to look at the point of view for the creation days of Genesis 1, 
the meaning of the word day, but most of my time is going to be focused on looking at the description and the order of the creation events in Genesis 1 and how we can progressively put them to a rigorous scientific test. Now, as you're probably aware, many scientists look at the, what Genesis 1 states as being utter scientific nonsense. But as I've engaged these scientists, almost always it's because they interpret it from the wrong point of view. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was Galileo who said, the biggest mistake you can make in Bible interpretation is to get the wrong point of view. And if you look at Genesis 1-2, uh, as you get into the six days, it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Some translations will say the surface of the waters. This is basically telling us that we're to interpret the account of the six creation days from the perspective or the point of view of an observer on the surface of the waters of planet Earth. Here's a diagram that illustrates this, that we're to interpret it from below the clouds, not above the clouds. And I would agree with my skeptical scientist friends, if you put that point of view above the clouds, Genesis 1 is teaching scientific nonsense. But if you put the point of view on the surface of the waters below the clouds, you get a very different interpretation of the text. Now, Genesis 1 is not the only biblical text that takes you through the six creation days. You also get it in Proverbs 8. You get it again in Psalm 104. You get it yet again in its most detail, scientific detail, in Job 37, 38, and 39. I'll also say this. A lot of skeptics critique Genesis 1 for what it leaves out. The fact that it leaves out some of the most important components of the creation story. It's helpful to recognize that the content of the book of Job predates that of Genesis by five or six centuries. And so what Moses leaves out is covered in considerable detail in the book of Job. <clears throat> and one of the things you find in the book of Job about these six days it tells us that before God begins to work on the earth, God speaks here and says, I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness. This answers the question, why was it dark on the surface of the primordial earth? It wasn't dark because there was no light in the universe. It wasn't dark because there was no sun. It was dark because the clouds blocked out the light from the stars and the sun from coming to the surface of the earth. Now, as an astronomer, I can tell you the primordial earth began with an atmosphere 200 times thicker than it is today. With an atmosphere that thick, no visible light will be able to penetrate to the surface of the waters. A good example today is Venus. Its atmosphere is more than 40 times thicker than the earth's. And the only light that gets through is light at the very deep red end of the spectrum. So that's point one. Uh, the second point in my outline is the meaning of the word yom, the Hebrew word yom, that's translated as day. And often these controversies about what Genesis teaches are predominantly English language controversies. And that's because English has an enormous vocabulary size, whereas biblical Hebrew has a very small vocabulary size. And often English readers are not cognizant of the fact that virtually every Hebrew noun has multiple literal definition. The word eres, translated earth, has five distinct literal definitions. The word yom has four. Part of the daylight hours, all of the daylight hours, a 24-hour period, or a long but finite period of time. <coughs> now... I did not know Hebrew when I first picked up a Bible at age 17. But what I noticed right away is that this word day must have at least three distinct literal definitions because three are used on the first page. Creation day one, it's contrasting days and nights. That's day for the daylight hours. Uh, creation day four, it's contrasting seasons, days, and years. That's day... Uh, referring to 24 hours, and Genesis 2-4 uses the word day to refer to the entirety of creation history. So that's day as a long period of time. 
And I remember at age 17, wondering about these days, continuing to read through the Old and New Testament, and discovering that there are three texts that tell us we're still in God's seventh day. Psalm 95, John 5, and Hebrews 4. And the other thing you notice is that you have an evening and a morning bracketing the first six creation days, telling us that each of those days has a definite start point and a definite end point. But there is no evening and morning for the seventh day, implying the seventh day is not yet finished. And as a scientist, I can see that because it's the day when God stops creating. And as a scientist, I don't see any evidence for God's supernatural intervention in the world of biology and the human era, but I see it everywhere before the human era. For six days God creates, on the seventh day he rests from his work of creation. Now, point three. This is the point I wanted to spend most of my time on in my short 20 minutes. And creation day one begins with the statement, let there be light. It's important to note that the text does not say uh, that God created light or that God made light. It says, let the light be. When did God create the light? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That phrase, the heavens and the earth, refers to the totality of physical reality. It's important to note that in biblical Hebrew, they have no word for universe. But this phrase, the heavens and the earth, means all matter, energy, space, and time. So there was energy, there was light from the very beginning. But not until creation day one did the light come through to the surface of the waters of planet Earth. As you can see in the book of Job, it tells us that it was the clouds that kept the seas dark. And so what was happening on creation day one was that the atmosphere is being transformed from opaque to translucent. Now, I'm going to jump ahead to creation day three. If you want to know what's going on in creation day two, I'd recommend look at Job 37 and 38, where it goes into detail about how God designed the water cycle for the benefit of us human beings actually creating different kinds of frozen and liquid precipitation for our benefit. But creation day four is something we've been able to put to the test with the very latest scientific discoveries. And the text simply says, let dry ground appear. And this is a reference to the event where planet Earth was transformed from a water world to a world where you got oceans and continents coexisting. So planet Earth, according to the Bible, began with an ocean that covered the whole surface of the earth. Uh, but in creation day three, that's transformed. Incidentally, uh, this is actually addressed in five different texts, in Proverbs, uh, Psalms, and a Job, where it speaks about God uh, transforming our planet from a water world to a world with continents and oceans. And only a planet with surface oceans and surface continents can you get the necessary recycling of nutrients to make animals and plants possible? Now, <clears throat> I was reading this when I was in my teenage years, and that was a time when geophysicists thought that the continents had always been here in virtually the same form that they are today. And I remember reading this and saying, wow, this doesn't look at all like what Genesis teaches. But I also knew that this claim that the continents had always been here was not supported by any data. So I said, I wonder how this is going to uh, play out as we actually learn more about the past history of the continental land masses. <coughs> okay, that was when I was 17. At age 19, I eagerly signed up for a course that was taught by two of the three geophysicists that had launched the discipline of plate tectonics. It's the first time the course was taught, and a lot of professors and students were eagerly uh, trying to squeeze into that class. I managed to get in there as a sophomore physics student. I was only sophomore there. But because my professors knew I wanted to pursue a career in astronomy, they allowed me to sit in on that class. 
And two of these geophysicists were explaining that this new discipline of plate tectonics implied that the continents uh, would get bigger and bigger as the Earth got older and older. And so I remember what they were teaching was that the continents started off small, and as plate tectonics uh, kicked in, the continents gradually covered more and more of the surface of the Earth. Now, I was curious too, does it really start off at say 7% like they were implying, or is it possible it's 0%? I remember asking one of the two professors, and he said, well, we think anything between zero and 10 is reasonable. So I said, okay, this is looking a lot more like what Genesis 1 teaches than what I heard just two years ago. Well, let me move forward to the year 2000. The year 2000 is when geophysicists for the first time were able to come up with a detailed history of the buildup of the continental land masses over the history of Earth. And uh, this is the graph that they produced. It's actually shown up in a number of textbooks and even books for the popular lay public, making the point that indeed planet Earth starts off as a water world. And then with the uh, initial plate tectonics, you get a few small volcanic islands. And then finally, the tectonics kicks in and builds up these cratons. That's a term for small continental landmass. But when the Earth is a little bit less than half of its present age, we see a very aggressive period of continental landmass buildup. Well, where does Genesis 1 put it? It puts it on the first part of creation day three. So you've got these six days of creation, and about halfway back, a little more than halfway back, the text tells us that's when uh, these continents uh, were built up, and we get the same picture with this graph. In fact, this actually shows up in my book, Navigating Genesis. Okay, late March of this year, a breakthrough paper was published where they pointed out that oxygen plays a critical role in the buildup of the continental land masses. It's the oxygenation of basaltic rocks that makes these lighter uh, rocks that float up and become continents. And they refer to what's called the great oxygenation event. Uh, that there is an event uh, when the Earth was about 2.2 to 2.3 billion years old, uh, where the oxygen jumped from 0.01% in the atmosphere up to about 2%. And it was that sudden jump in oxygen uh, that they pointed out would have called, caused also a sudden jump in the amount of continents that cover the Earth. And this is the graph that they had produced. And so what you see is that for about a billion years, Earth remains as a water world. And then plate tectonics kicks in, but you really don't get much continental buildup. It builds up to about one and a half to two percent of the surface area of the Earth. And then with the great oxygenation event, it jumps all the way up to 27 percent. And then for the last couple of billion years, it's been gradually increasing to its present 29 percent. I mean, what this graph really shows you is if you go from 1950 up to 2018, we see that advancing scientific discoveries give us greater and greater concordance with what Genesis 1 has been teaching for thousands of years, making the point that the more we learn about geophysics, uh, the more consistency we see with the text. And if you actually read the text in the original Hebrew, it seems to imply that we have a very sudden growth in these continental land masses. And this paper published <clears throat> a few months ago uh, documents that very thing. If you want to read more about this, I actually wrote a blog that you can access at reasons.org. Every week I write an article about some new scientific discovery that makes for a stronger case for the Christian faith. And the June 11th article, I talk about this discovery of what happened on creation day three. Okay, I'm gonna move you to the second part of creation day three, where the text says, let the land produce vegetation. Now, I've debated Michael Shermer on university campuses four separate times. He's the executive director of the Skeptic Society that's headquartered here in Altadena. 
And no matter what the topic is, he always goes to the Genesis 1. He sees this as the Achilles heel of the Christian faith. And in particular, he's made the claim in each of these debates, Genesis got it wrong. The fossil record says the animals come first, the plants come second. Specifically, we get animals in the oceans first, and we get vegetation on the continent second, and the, your Bible puts it the other way around. Now, my response in the first two of those debates was simply to point out, well, Michael, uh, animals have bones and skeletons. Those are going to be easily preserved over hundreds of millions of years. And the first animals show up 575 million years ago. But plants that old, they have body tissues that simply aren't going to be preserved in the fossil record for that period of time. But what has happened since are the publications of two papers. The one in Nature 2009 says, we don't have the fossils, but we got the isotope evidence that tells us vegetation was just as abundant on the continents for 200 million years before the first appearance of animals in the oceans. And then in 2011, a paper was published where he said, we've actually found the fossils. Well, it's an overstatement. The biggest fossil they found was a millimeter across. They found a fossil part. And realistically, that's all you'd ever anticipate would be preserved. And one of them actually dated back to 1.2 billion years, making the point that vegetation was abundant in the continents for 600 million years before the first appearance of animals in the ocean. Well, I want to finish up <clears throat> with what happened on creation day four, where it says, let there be lights in the sky. And it's referring to the time when the sun, moon, and stars first appear in the sky to creatures on the surface of the earth. Now, what happened with the oxygen, that little blip that you see over there, that's what's called the great oxygenation event. But shortly after the great oxygenation event, the oxygen dropped back down to below 1% and stayed that way until 575 million years ago. Then the oxygen made a sudden jump from less than 1% to 8%. And incidentally, that's exactly when you see the first animals. You can't have animals unless you've got at least 8% oxygen in the atmosphere. The moment you do, the animals are there. There's no time delay. They show up right away. But <clears throat> I actually wrote a blog article making a reference to a physics experiment where in the lab, they actually modeled what happens to the atmosphere when you go from 20 parts per million oxygen which is what we had 580 million years ago, up to 210,000 parts oxygen, which is what we have today. But what I'm going to show you is what happens when you go from less than 1% oxygen up to 8% oxygen. Basically, the physics lab experiment said the more oxygen you have in the atmosphere, the less hazy the atmosphere becomes. Or to put it the other way, the less oxygen, the more hazy it is. Well. What I've done is to be able to duplicate the effect on the atmosphere through this photograph I took of Engineer Peak in Colorado. And so this would be kind of what the peak would look like when you only got 1% oxygen in the atmosphere. Then we gradually increase the oxygen and you get to see this, that the haze gradually dissipates, continues to dissipate. And guess what? You get to see the moon. Okay? So initially, it was so hazy, you couldn't see the moon or the sun. And then you get to see the moon. And it's the visibility of the sun, moon, and stars that allows the animals that God creates on creation day five to regulate their biological clocks. But again, if you want to read about this, you can access the uh, Reasons to Believe, New Reason to Believe article on June 18th that I wrote. Now... This is just a sampling, but if you actually do this with all the events of the creation days, all 10 events, this is what you discover. Noticing that the word yom for the creation days is an epoch of time, a finite period of time, and the frame of reference is the surface of the earth, the science accuracy score you get for the 10 events of creation that are described in the six creation days 
is 10 for 10. It gets a perfect score. And it was that recognition that had a huge impact of my giving my life to Jesus Christ eight years before I got to meet a Christian up in the Canada. But the point is, now that we're in 2018, we have a far stronger case that indeed Genesis got everything right, uh, not just in approximate detail, but in great detail. And again, if you want to read more about this, you can get uh, Navigating Genesis. We have it out there. If you want the free chapter, just go to reasons.org.ross, the slash Ross. But the bottom line is this. The more we learn about science, the more reasons we gain to believe that the Bible is the Word of God. So this is your opportunity now to text questions in. I'm going to invite <coughs> Ross to come back up here. And as Ross said, we will take any question that you want to raise. It does not have to pertain to the topic that we just discussed in the last 20 minutes. Uh, but if you've got six questions, we invite you to take six separate turns. I think the uh, texting is going to force that anyway. I, right? I get to edit this, so. All right. Thank you. Are you ready for this, Ken? Hugh, we've got some great questions. But no softball questions. No, right? no. These All right. I'll start with this one. If the multiverse is true, why is there a need for the Christian God? Very good question. I actually addressed that in quite a bit of detail in the fourth edition of The Crater and the Cosmos. I'll give you an abbreviated answer. I remember back in the 1980s telling university audiences, eventually the fine-tuning evidence for the crater god of the Bible, scientifically, will become so overwhelming that the non-theists will have nowhere else to go but to hypothesize an infinite number of universes where every universe is different, where they'll claim that we happen to live in the one lucky universe where everything has just the right features and characteristics. And it was none other than Leonard Susskind, an atheist theoretical physicist said, this is a terrible argument for us atheists, basically making the point that any theory that explains everything explains nothing. And he basically, that's all he said. What I've done in the crater in the cosmos is to give you an example of what he was talking about. That if you really have that kind of a multiverse, you're going to have an infinite variety of birch trees. And if you know anything about birch trees, they peel white pieces of bark. Well, if you've got an infinite variety of species of birch trees, one of them will be peeling pieces of white bark that measure eight and a half by 11 inches. And on an infinite number of planets, those pieces of bark will fall on soil that's got random chemicals in it that make markings on these pieces of bark that look exactly like all the equations, diagrams, uh, letters, paragraphs that you see in every research paper published by every uh, non-theistic scientist, which means those papers didn't come from their mind, it came from the multiverse. And that's kind of Leonard Susskind's point. You would not only be explaining away divine design, you're explaining away every human design. You have a philosophical inconsistency. But the other thing I would add, I think there is a way to put this to a positive test. If the atheistic version of the multiverse is correct, then at some point, this accumulating fine-tuning evidence will begin to go down rather than up. So if the theistic version is correct, the more we learn about the universe, the greater and greater will become the fine-tuning evidence that that creator God was responsible. But if it really is the atheistic version of the multiverse, at some point we'd expect to see declining evidence for that fine-tuning design. So what's been the track record of the past 50 years? It's always gone up. Moreover, it's not only gone up, it's gone up exponentially, which is something we document in the fourth edition of The Crater and the Cosmos. Thank you. Great, great answer. Um, I don't know where uh, area code 205 is, but there's a lot of geniuses there. We're getting some really good questions. <laughs> um, the evidence for common descent seems to be increasing. At what point will this be a problem for RTB and your special creation theory? Well, when you hear, hear uh, biologists saying the evidence for a common descent is increasing, what they're really saying is we're seeing increasing evidence for the genetic similarity 
of life here on planet Earth. But what we've been pointing out here are reasons to believe that's exactly what you'd expect if you've got a single supernatural creator. That that single supernatural creator will repeat optimized designs. I mean, to give you an example, uh, think of, say, a Toyota Motor Company. They will go to a lot of work to design a chassis for an automobile. But because they've optimized that chassis, they'll use it for all their models. They repeat the design over and over again. So the real question is, is this common uh, descent naturalistic uh, or is it has a supernatural explanation? Are the common designs that we see amongst all life forms optimized or are they crippled designs? And that's kind of where the atheists are going. They're saying we see all this evidence uh, for uh, crippled designs. And so that's kind of where the debate is. Are the designs we see at the genetic level, the morphological level, are giving us increasing evidence that it's optimal, or are we seeing evidence that these are really bad designs? Well, our own human body, I think, is a good example of that. <clears throat> I'm old enough, for example, to recall that time when it was routine in the public schools uh, that every first grader had their tonsils and adenoids removed. Why? Because evolution is presumed that that was a bad design in the human body, so let's get rid of it. And probably a number of you realize there was a time, too, whenever you had ob abdominal uh, surgery, they always took out the appendix because they thought the appendix was a useless design holdover from evolution. What has happened since is we realize that tonsils and adenoids serve a vital purpose, as does the appendix. The appendix has no function for digestion, but it does play an important role in the immune response system. Likewise, the tonsils and adenoids play a role in the immune response system. The problem was people weren't looking uh, for that kind of design. And so the track record of the past 40 years has been one of increasing evidence these designs are optimized. And if they're optimized, we would expect the creator to repeat them over and over again. Hugh, does the proper study and um, interpretation of science in the natural world lead one to the knowledge of Jesus, or does it just bring you to, the, to a knowledge of the existence of God? A you know, very good question. Uh, several months ago, I participated in an online video debate. And it wasn't just a debate with one person. It was a debate with a whole bunch of people from around the world that use their computers to engage me. It's amazing, this 21st century in which we live, uh, that I can engage uh, scholars literally all over the world uh, through my computer, where they see me and I see them. But there was a lady in Ireland who asked me that question. She says, I understand how you can establish from science a deistic God, but how do you go from deism to theism to Jesus Christ as a creator? And so I said, well, let me just share with you three ways. Those three ways took me an hour, so I'm not going to answer, take an hour to answer the question. Uh, but probably the shortest one is I explained to her that science only makes sense if God is triune. And the Trinity is a unique doctrine of the Christian faith. All other religions teach a very different perspective on God. Only Christians teach that God is three persons in one essence. And when you look at the world of science, what you notice, it testifies of a single creation plan. I mean, there's, there's harmony across all the scientific disciplines. It speaks of one plan, one purpose, coming from a single mind. And that's kind of the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, that you're going to get the same character attribute with the Father that you get with the Son, that you get with the Holy Spirit. They got the same purpose the same plan, the same mind. They don't have a debate on how they're going to create. And so we see in science as a testimony of a single plan coming from a single per person and a single mind. On the other hand, we look at we human beings, and we have the capacity to express love to one another and receive love from one another. Love, by definition, requires a minimum of two persons. If all you've got is one person, you've got no love. And that's one of our critiques of both Judaism and Islam. They've got no answer for the origin of love. 
or particularly with Islam, where their mantra is, nothing is greater than God. Well, you got this God who had no experience of love creating beings that do. So in that context, he actually creates something that's greater than himself. Or to put it another way, he must create in order to experience love where the Christian God already is in a loving relationship before the create. Creation is a choice. It's not a requirement. Uh, if you want the other two, we got articles on the website. <laughs> Thank you, Hugh. This person says, I recalled hearing there is a growing majority of physicists, advanced mathematicians, and astronomers who acknowledge God's existence. Being in the field, do you agree, and do you see this trend continuing? Well, what I do see is that <clears throat> over the last hundred years, there's always been many more physical scientists that are believers than life scientists, and many more life scientists who are believers than social scientists. <laughs> And uh, there's been surveys that have been done, uh, spread, spread apart by many decades, where they look at, say, men and women as science. And uh, the number for mathematicians has always been the highest. About 80% of research mathematicians believe in God in an afterlife. And that's been relatively constant over the past century. At the bottom end, you've got uh, sociologists that are around 1%. So, and I think there might be a selection factor here. Uh, people who tend to really like logic, rationality, and facts that can be pinned down with great precision, they're more likely to go into mathematics, physics, astronomy, geology, and chemistry. So I'm not surprised that we see more believers uh, in the hard sciences than we do, say, the life sciences, and especially the social sciences. I mean, if you want to try to wiggle your way out of the facts for God, a good place to go is the social sciences. But I think the, uh, <coughs> the questioner is asking, is the is there number of scientists uh, who believe in God increasing? Okay, I address this in my book, More Than a Theory, <coughs> where the two most extensive surveys were done in 1916 and 1996. And in 1916, it was done by a philosopher, uh, Professor Luba, and he predicted that the percentage of believers in the sciences would dramatically drop as we went forward from 1916 into the future. Instead, we sound, found it didn't drop at all. The survey was repeated in 1996, and both surveys said 45% of all scientists, physical, life, and social, believe in God and an afterlife. So the percentage has not changed over 100 years. The prediction was advancing science would drop the percentage. Has not dropped it at all. But I think another interesting question, are there changes going on amongst the disciplines? And uh, the two biggest changes is that physical chemists have risen up to a degree of belief uh, that's equal or higher than what you see with physicists and astronomers. Mm -hmm. And right now they rank just below what you see uh, with mathematicians. The other big increase in belief has been research biologists. Uh, their percentage has gone up considerably. And I actually got to see that personally at Caltech. When I first arrived there in 1973, about 1% 1 of the research biologists would claim that they were Christians, believing in God and an afterlife. And in one of the TV shows that I hosted, I interviewed three Caltech research biologists. This would have been in the uh, early 1990s, and they came from three different research groups of about 35 research biologists each. Two of them said 25% of our group would claim to be Christians. The third one said 50% of my group would claim to be Christians. And of course, I asked them, what's the big difference? They said the big difference is Caltech now requires uh, that when you get a PhD in biology, you have to take more than just one or two classes in upper mathematics. So it's the injection of mathematics uh, into the graduate research program uh, that they claim made the difference. Because it shows how impossible evolution is when you start putting numbers to it? Well, I can, re okay, back in 1966, this has only happened once, they had a joint conference of evolutionary biologists and mathematicians. <laughs> And you can read the proceedings to this day. 
Uh, what happened in that conference is the mathematicians basically demolished the evolutionary paradigm, one paper after another. The reaction of the evolution of biologists, we'll never have a conference like this again. <laughs> and there's never been one like that since. It's only happened once. Hugh, how do the creation stories from other religions compare to the scientific record? That's something I actually show you side by side in Navigating Genesis. I take the best of the non-Christian uh, creation uh, accounts from the ancient world, uh, which would be that from Sumeria and Akkadia, and basically put the two accounts side by side, uh, because a lot of skeptics will say, look at the similarities. My point was, look at the differences. There's enormous differences between the two accounts. And the idea that Moses borrowed from these ancient texts uh, doesn't hold water when you actually compare what they say. I mean, give you an example. What you see in the Sumerian Akkadian tablets of creation is you've got all these different gods, and they fight one another. Uh, often things get created through the battles they have with one another. And uh, they're just as much as sinners as we are. So you don't see this moral perfection amongst the gods like you do uh, in Christianity. Uh, they have all the foibles and uh, sins that we human beings have. And the order is all wrong. For example, uh, the first animals to show up would be human beings. We show up first, whereas you notice in Genesis, the human beings show up last. If you want to know where we human beings come from, it's two of these gods having a battle with one another, and the blood spilled from their, their uh, uh, you know, slashing each other with swords. That's where we human beings come from. You get a little bit of a different story in uh, Genesis 1. And I think what's going on here is because the Sumerian Akkadian records uh, date so old, people think, well, the oldest accounts got to be the most accurate. And since uh, Hebrew it became a written language much later, they claim, well, they must have borrowed and uh, basically um, uh, you know, distorted the text. I would argue that the distortion is what we see in the Akkadian and Sumerian records, which you see in the Bible as the faithful text. And it's simply, uh, I think, 21st century hubris to think because they don't have a written language, it must be more primitive. I think what they're not taking into account is that people groups that do not have a written language have a phenomenal capacity to preserve their history through word-for-word -word memorization. And I think a good biblical example of that's the book of Job. When you look at the book of Job, you notice almost all of it is Hebrew poetry. But it's Hebrew poetry that's designed to be easily memorized word-for-word. -word. Now, not easily for 21st century citizens. We have lost our ability to memorize because we have all this technology that mem memorizes things for us. But take away all that technology. Uh, matter of fact, I'm old enough where I can recall we had to memorize a thousand lines from one of William Shakespeare's plays. Mm. I mean, giving that as an assignment to a student in college today would be considered cruel and unusual punishment. Was that, was that from one of your physics classes? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, in physics, we just had to memorize the equations. Uh, That's worse. <laughs> but the whole point is, I think we got good textual evidence that the book of Job predates that of uh, Genesis by five or six centuries. Evidence such as the fact that the animal sacrifices were being done by the patriarchs, not by priests. And also it's a time before nations existed. And so this would have been before Hebrew was a written language, but I think how it was preserved, people memorized it word for word. In fact, in my book on Job, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job, I argue that the young man Elihu was memorizing word for word uh, the dialogue that he was experiencing between Job and his three friends. That's my explanation for why he didn't say anything until the 32nd chapter. <laughs> he was working hard to preserve everything that was being said amongst the four. And yeah, people who don't have a written language, they can do that kind of thing. Hugh, one of our friends from the Jacksonville chapter, Justin Doyle, asks, I was wondering how do you interpret the passages in early Genesis regarding people that lived to be several hundred years old. If that is literal, how is it possible to go from, from such great ages to the age lengths we see now? 
Very good question. You want a detailed answer, it's chapter 13 of Navigating Genesis. Um, when you look at the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11, I interpret those genealogies, those are the few people from the pre-flood era that actually died a natural death. Uh, in my book, Navigating Genesis, I make the point the vast majority of humans had their lives terminated by being murdered by their fellow man. And in one sense, the flood is a rescue of humanity from imminent self-extermination. In fact, I also argue that we humans today have the longest average lifespan, longer than those people living before the flood that have potential to live eight or 900 years. But what I address in chapter 13 of Navigating Genesis uh, is that <clears throat> there are two astronomers, uh, Ehrlichan from Russia and Wolfendale from Britain, who've been teamed up for 40 years examining cosmic rays. And what they pointed out 40 years ago, about 95% of the killer cosmic rays, these are cosmic rays that have nuclei heavier than oxygen, moving at near relativistic velocities. Most of the cosmic rays are protons and electrons. They do do some damage, uh, but you can live a long time with electrons and protons. Uh, having iron nuclei penetrating your body at relativistic velocities, that does a lot of damage. And that's one of the reasons why we have a high cancer rate. We're exposed to these dangerous cosmic rays. But these two astronomers pointed out that these cosmic rays come from a single recent supernova event. In fact, in their latest paper, they said, we found the remnant of the supernova. It's called the Monoceros ring. It's 15 degrees across in the sky. In fact, a little bit uh, later this year, you'll be able to see it in the early evening, uh, just off of the constellation Orion. And, uh, but because it's so big, it's been very difficult to detect because of how diffuse it is but it means a supernova erupted close to the Earth and erupted sometime in the last 100,000 years. So here's a scenario. Before the flood, no supernova. After the flood, you've got that deadly supernova, which is gonna limit your lifespan. However, something else that will limit your lifespan is exposure to igneous rocks. And no matter where you go in the world today, you get exposed to igneous rocks more so in Moscow than you do here in Los Angeles. But hey, when you drive the freeway, you're being exposed to igneous rocks. Guess what's in those igneous rocks? Uranium and thorium. And the decay of uranium and thorium will shorten your lifespan. Uh, the other thing that could shorten your lifespan is eating meat. But notice in uh, Genesis, before the flood, God said, stay away from meat. Now, after the flood, he says, you can eat meat. <laughs> His point was, you're only going to live 120 years maximum. <laughs> if you're only going to live that many years, you can eat all the meat you want. It's not going to do you any harm. But if you want to live to be 900, you need to avoid meat because you'll accumulate too many heavy metals over several centuries. <clears throat> and the other factor is, to live 900 years, you have to have less aggressive telomerase uh, activity. Our chromosomes are designed to get shorter and shorter as we get older and older. That's actually a good thing. If your chromosomes weren't shortening at the rate they are right now, we'd be dying much earlier deaths from cancer. It actually is a guard against uh, getting cancer at an early age. But if you don't have all that cancer risk from radiation, there's no need to have the telomerase activity as aggressive as it is. So yeah, you could actually live eight or 900 years. But the ones mentioned in the Bible are the exceptions. They died a natural death. Most of the rest of the human race was dying when they're 20, 30, or 40 by mm -hmm. being killed by their fellow man. You, I really want to know if that includes bacon. I, 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 I want to be able to tell my wife that you said I could eat as much bacon as I want. Anyway. anyway. Well, there are other consequences. <laughs> Let, let there be light seems like a sudden occurrence. How does this agree with the gradual changing of the atmosphere over millions of years? Well, let there be light refers to uh, creation day one. And I do think that was relatively sudden. In fact, what I write about in Navigating Genesis and in much more detail than Probable Planet, the moon forming event 
uh, would have stripped Earth of its primordial atmosphere and it would have been an atmosphere 200 times thinner that would have replaced it. Uh, you know, that's a relatively rapid uh, phenomena and therefore you would have a transition from no light at all to light coming through. The gradual event is what you see in creation day four where it says, let there be the great lights. And that's where we have, and incidentally, it's not that gradual because we go from an oxygen content of less than 1% to 8% in much less than a million years. It might have been only a few thousand years where you see that sudden jump of oxygen. And so again, that's a relatively rapid phenomena where the atmosphere goes from so hazy, you can't see any sun, moon, and stars in the sky where you can actually see them. Uh, it's important to note, too, what follows in the second half of verse 14. Let there be the great lights, so that they may serve as signs to mark seasons, days, and years, as the animals that need to see the sun, moon, and stars. And notice, no animals until after day four. They're the ones that need to know where the sun, moon, and stars are in the sky in order to regulate their biological clocks. Thank you. Is RTB developing a science faith position specific to the LGBTQT controversy in the Western Church? Well, what we have done is written some articles uh, addressing, is it really true that uh, humans, some humans are born uh, where they're basically uh, wired in such a way that they must become homosexuals or lesbians? And uh, the claim that that is the case is based on a single research paper uh, where they looked at the chemistry of uh, practicing homosexual men and uh, noticed that the chemistry of their brain was different than that of heterosexual males. <clears throat> However, we critiqued the paper by saying they did not measure the chemistry of young boys. It was only adult men. Moreover, it was only adult men uh, that were engaging in uh, considerable sexual intercourse with other men. And so we're arguing maybe the chemistry is induced by the behavior rather than some inborn uh, genetic idea. Although we do recognize uh, that some people have a greater genetic propensity to become, say, an alcoholic or to become depressed uh, or to become attracted to the opposite sex. But I would appeal to people who have that genetic uh, propensity towards alcoholism, you can say no to it. Uh, it's not something that's forced upon the person that has that. They just have to be aware. I'm a little more susceptible to becoming addicted. And so I've met people like that and say, well, you just need to be, uh, you need to put into your life safeguards, just realizing that you're genetically predisposed. predisposed. Same thing with people. Uh, some people are genetically wired to more easily become depressed. Uh, I don't think I've ever been depressed in a day in my life. My wife says, I got a genetic disorder uh, that prevents me. <laughs> you know, I'm just this Pollyanna guy that thinks everything's great all the time. Here's this guy in 205 again. P uh, please relay your thoughts on how born again Christians should handle our differences on peripheral issues like age of the earth. Here in Alabama, this issue destroys fellowship and love between believers. Well, this new book we got out, Always Be Ready, where we talk about being prepared to share your faith with gentleness and respect and preparing good reasons and watching God perform miracles in your life uh, when you do it. One of the passages that we cite is 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20, which basically says to believers, I've called you to be ambassadors for peace, to call non-Christians to make their peace with God. That only works if the non-Christians can see us making peace with one another. And so I tell my friends, for example, who are young earth and uh, tend to take that position more seriously than they should, is that non-Christians are watching how we disagree mm -hmm. on the age of the earth. And if they see us behaving in very vindictive ways towards one another, their reaction is going to be, there's no way I'm going to get near any of these Christians. They're not going to trust us uh, to be an ambassador of peace for them. Uh, and it was Jesus who said, they will know, referring to non-believers, they will know you're my disciples because of your love for one That's another. Right. 
And what Paul says, it's important that there be divisions amongst you. It's important that there be divisions so that the non-Christians can see how we treat one another when we've got disagreements and divisions. And as far as the young earth, old earth issue goes, I always point out to my young earth friends, this does not appear in any of the creeds of the church, which means it's not an essential for our Christian faith. Um, likewise, you know, whether we're premillennial or amillennial, that's not essential for our Christian faith, which means there's no way we should ever be vindictive towards one another over something that is a non-essential. However, what I've noticed is that's not, not always conceded. A number of young earth creationists I know think it's a very critical doctrine, and they actually want to have it put in the creeds. But I think those who framed the creeds were wise. They said, let's just keep the creeds to the essentials of the Christian faith, and we can divide over the non-essentials, and we can divide in charity. And if you actually look at the early church fathers, they were all over the place on this issue. Uh, but none of them saw it as an important doctrinal issue, and they treated one another with great charity. We need to do the same. Thank you. In Genesis, the first generations of humans seem to be familiar with agriculture. Yes. Is there any evidence of agriculture that goes back to humanity's beginning? Yes, there is. I actually document some of that in my book, Improbable Planet. And in a couple of blog articles I've written the past few months, I document the very latest evidence for that. Namely, what we discover is that uh, humans living as far back as 35,000 years ago were actually manufacturing bakery products. And so they were farming grains, harvesting the grains, grinding the grains, roasting them, and turning them into bakery products. And for the first time, beginning about two years ago, they found archaeological evidence to support this, backed up by carbon-14 dating, uh, which gave us a secure date from when this was going on. However, that research also establishes it was on a very small scale. So it explains why we haven't discovered it until very recently. And what I did in Improbable Planet explained why it's on such a small scale. Because 35,000 years ago, instead of the climate stability we have today, we had extreme climate instability. The global mean temperature was jumping up and down uh, by more than 24 degrees Fahrenheit on time scales of one or two centuries. And with that degree of climate instability, you cannot have a large farm, More, nor can you specialize. You're basically stuck with having one or two acres where you grow 12 to 15 crops with the hope that maybe three crops will succeed and you feed your family in those three crops. And likewise with animal husbandry, you can't depend just on goats or cows or chickens. You better have them all because who knows which ones are gonna survive, which ones are gonna produce. And during the last ice age, evidence is that humans were forced to devote about 98% of their labor force to coming up with enough food. So people say, why didn't, weren't they as technologically advanced as we are? Well, today in the US, less than 1% of our population is dedicated to producing food. What does that mean? The other 99% can pursue careers in engineering, technology, science, mathematics, arts, music, communication. We can do all that, right? Uh, that was not an option uh, 35,000 years ago. And I'm actually predicting we're going to uncover evidence for metallurgy that dates back that early. But again, it's going to be in a very small scale just because of a force of extreme climate instability. Incidentally, the next book I'm writing is making the point extreme climate instability is going to come back. And uh, it will have, it'll be the end of civilization as we know it. But hey, my sons tell me that if we wind up with no GPS, that will be the end of civilization <laughs> as we know it. That's right. Hugh, somebody from your neck of the woods in Vancouver is asking, what are some of the strongest pieces of evidence that we have versus the creation, uh, cre evolutionary creationists? Oh, contrasting evolutionary creationism with our model? Yes. Well, they want to see that in some detail. We've actually came up with a two views book uh, that was sponsored by the Templeton Foundation, where it was our scientists and theologians 
writing side by side with scientists and theologians from BioLogos. So you can kind of see and what actually we engage in that project because we have very significant differences biblically and scientifically but we wanted to be able to display our differences uh, with a charitable spirit. I think the book accomplished that. If you want something a little briefer, less technical to read, there's a book that came out a year ago called Four Views on Creation, Evolution, and Intelligent Design. And it includes the presidents of uh, Reasons to Believe, BioLogos, Answers in Genesis, and the Discovery Institute. So again, there are, the differences are displayed. Uh, but I think the biggest scientific differences is that the evolutionary creationists believe that we human beings are the product of common natural descent uh, from an ancestor that we have in common with the Neanderthals, uh, Homo erectus, and the chimpanzees. So we're the product of natural evolution. They would also argue that the ancestral population of the human race is more than 10,000 individuals. Whereas we're arguing that we're the product of special creation, we also argue that the Neanderthals, Homo erectus, and chimpanzees are also the product of special creation. In fact, we cited in the, those exchanges we had with them that there are field experiments that demonstrate any land mammal that has an adult body size bigger than seven pounds will go extinct before it evolves. Mm. And since all these bipedal primate species and all the great apes have adult body sizes bigger than seven pounds, they didn't get here uh, through naturalistic common descent evolution. And so we were basically challenging our uh, friends of BioLogos. It's great you got these theoretical models that indicate our ancestral population is 10,000 individuals, but for that to have any uh, credibility it must be backed up by field experiments. And we cited four different field experiments which basically get the opposite conclusion. Mm. Uh, that when you do experiments, for example, where you take two individuals from a species, put them on an isolated island, and let them reproduce, you wind up with way more genetic diversity than what the theoretical models predict. Which means that 10,000 individuals that you see in Francis Collins' book is an upper limit, and the lower limit could be all the way down to two. In fact, in my most recent debate with the president of BioLogos, she said, I can come all the way down to 132. And I said, well, I'm older than you are, Deborah. I remember when they said the ancestral population was one million. That was about 45 years ago. Then it dropped down to 100,000. And then we have Francis Collins a decade ago saying 10,000. when. Uh, a Fuzz Rana debated the geneticist uh, David Venema. He said uh, 1,200 to 800. And then we have uh, Deborah Harzma going down to 132. So in that dialogue with her, I said, how about if we plot a graph and see which way the trend is going? <laughs> it seems to be heading down to the biblical two. <laughs> and the genetic evidence is consistent with a biblical two, but it doesn't prove a biblical two, but it is consistent. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. <clears throat> Neanderthal DNA has been identified in some population groups. This seems to suggest successful interbreeding of humans and animals. Do you agree? And I would add, how does that affect the Imago Dei, us being image bearers of God? Right. Well, keep in mind that uh, our DNA is roughly 99% similar to Neanderthal DNA. Also keep in mind, your DNA is about 26% similar to daffodil DNA. And so, again, we're talking about common descent versus common design. Uh, since so much of our uh, protein metabolism is similar to daffodils and it's optimal, we expect to have that similarity with the daffodils. Neanderthals have hearts and lungs and livers that are a lot like ours. They have to be for both of us to function. So the similarity, I think, is understandable. Our point is that 1% difference is enormous. And because of that 1% difference, there is a consensus amongst geneticists, including the atheist geneticists, we are two distinct species. Uh, we're not the same species. That 1% difference is just too large. Now, the claim that uh, we, there, there's, there was interbreeding between humans and Neanderthals some 45,000 years ago um, is based on a paper 
where 11 geneticists studied some Neanderthal specimens and uh, compared their DNA with different ethnic groups in the human population. And what they discerned was that there is more similarity between human DNA and Neanderthal DNA amongst Europeans, Asians, and Pacific Islanders than there is amongst uh, sub-Saharan Africans. But I remember reading the paper when it first came out. The 11 authors included Europeans, Asians, and South Pacific Islanders. There wasn't a single sub-Saharan African listed amongst the 11. And when I read the paper, they said, we did our best to ensure that we didn't contaminate the Neanderthal DNA, but we can't guarantee that contamination didn't take place. So I've been on record as proposing, before we give significant credibility to this claim that there was interbreeding, we need to repeat the whole experiment with Neanderthal DNA that's not been touched by humans, where the geneticists are all sub-Saharan Africans, and see what we get. I mean, for this to be believable, that's what I'd really want to see. On the other hand, when I read the paper, it also made the point that if this Neanderthal interbreeding signal, by the way, the signal was very weak. And in physics, we don't get published until we have a signal to noise ratio more than five to one. The signal to noise ratio in this case was below five to one. Mm. But in biology, that's <coughs> enough to get published. Um, and <coughs> they did say, however, the signal is so weak, uh, they did not see it in the uh, nuclear DNA only in the mitochondrial DNA, that they said this establishes that if this really was happening, the level of bestiality 45,000 years ago is way below the level of bestiality amongst humans today. Mm. Basically making the point, even if it's real, it would have no impact on the Imago Dei because of how tiny or limited the interbreeding was. But I'm personally not convinced that the interbreeding signal uh, is definitively established. I think there's lots of reasons to doubt it. Moreover, where you do see the comparisons uh, between the European uh, similarity with Neanderthal DNA, it's in a region where I would expect that that similarity actually has a benefit for both the Europeans and the Neanderthals that are living at a high latitude. So, uh, I mean, if I saw that it was a uh, a deleterious mutation, provably deleterious in both cases, I would think they would have a stronger case. Incidentally, if you want to talk to a real expert on this, uh, there is uh, a physical anthropologist that's part of our volunteer uh, scholar team. Uh, her name is Sue Dykes. She just got her PhD in uh, physical anthropology. She's our, our foremost expert in this area. And having talked to her, uh, she says, I'm a real skeptic of this uh, claim, hmm. and she gives good reasons why we should be skeptical. Hugh, let's say for some time in the future that a, there is in irrefutable evidence that there was some crossbreeding between humans and, and Neanderthals. Would that affect the image of God in Imago Dei? We discussed this in our book with Biologos, making the point that if that were the case, this would actually fit what we see in the early chapters of Genesis. Namely, that, and you'll see this in the book Navigating Genesis, where it talks about the sons of God coming down and having physical intercourse uh, with the daughters of men, is that Satan has a strong motivation uh, to disturb the image of God. What better way to disturb it than through bestiality? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's angelic bestiality, there's also bestiality with the non-human animals. And I think this explains why in the book of Leviticus, we see such strong language uh, directed towards bestiality. I mean, there's no place in Leviticus where the language is stronger on why we need to refrain uh, from bestiality. And I think it's because it's got the potential to affect the image of God. But on that basis, I wouldn't be surprised that Satan would try to set up uh, some uh, sexual incident between Neanderthals and humans, and they'd be right in line with his strategy uh, to attack God's plan. Well, it's gone by really fast, Hugh. We have time for one more quick question. Uh, regarding the fine-tuning argument, what would you say 
has been the most effective or best objection that you've heard to that argument? Well, if you were to ask non-theistic scientists what they consider the best objection uh, to the fine-tuning argument, uh, they would say the multiverse, the atheistic version of the multiverse. I want to make it clear, there are theistic versions of the multiverse. But as my colleague uh, Jeff Zwerink has pointed out, uh, the theistic versions are free of contradictions. The atheistic versions are fraught with contradictions. Mm. That's the distinction. And the irony is you actually have these non-Christians borrowing a medieval Christian idea. It was medieval theologians, Christian theologians, that said nothing less than an infinite universe would befit an infinite God. So it's kind of ironic they're borrowing a Christian idea uh, to try to get around this fine-tuning. Um, so it would be the multiverse, which we've already talked about. But I think also a good response to that is that typically when non-Christian physicists and astronomers think of fine-tuning, they're only considering the fine-tuning of the universe and the laws of physics. The truth is we see fine-tuning at all size scale levels. Our cluster of galaxies must be fine-tuned. Our galaxy must be fine-tuned. Our star must be fine-tuned. And in each case, we see evidence that it's unique. Uh, there is no galaxy cluster like ours that can support advanced life. Uh, there is no galaxy far, far away. The only galaxies that candidate is our Milky Way galaxy. For 60 years, we've been looking for a star that's enough like our sun to be a candidate to have a planet with advanced life on it. We can't find such a star. Lots of stars are twins of one another. Our star does not have a twin. And likewise, there's no planetary system like ours. We now know that every one of the eight planets must be exactly the way they are for you and I to have this dialogue tonight. Wow. So the fine tuning is at all levels, all the way down to the fundamental particles. Well, if, if this is any indication of how this is going to go, this is going to be a great hit. I want to thank all the people that texted in questions. I kept scrolling through here, and I said, that's a great question. And then I go to another one. Well, that's a better question. <laughs> So there were probably literally four times more questions, good questions, than I had time to ask. So thank you, everyone. I want to say this is the first of five that we're going to do. Every th the last Thursday night of every month except December. Thank you. So thank you, everybody, for participating. Once again, um, there are somewhere, there's a feedback form if you would please fill out the survey and those of you online I think there's a button in your upper right hand corner you can click on and tell us how we're doing we really want to know so we can continue this next month's reason forum will be on Thursday October 25th at 630 and it's going to feature Ken Samples the philosopher here on staff at reasons to believe and his presentation is titled five ways historic Christianity is reasonable there are, for those of you who are here in the live audience, there's food over here, and all of um, Reasons to Believe's books are in the bookstore over there. I don't know how you would choose between those two. <laughs> <laughs> They're both pretty good. So, Dr. Ross, thank you so much for You're participating welcome. in this. We really appreciate it.